our guest speaker for the night. So glad he could make it. Looking forward to this. We met Adam at the um, UQ when he and uh, his colleague uh, had an evening there uh, showing the uh, West Door 66 documentary. And a few of us went along to that. And I think there were about 30, 35 people there that night, something like that. And that was where we met him. So we said, hey, would you like to come and speak to our group? We're sure that they'd love to hear what you have to say. So here he is tonight. He's going to talk to us about ignoring UFOs, examining the powerful desire to do nothing. Um, Dr. Adam Dodd received his PhD in media and culture in 2009 and currently teaches media studies and communication at the School of Communication and Arts at the University of Queensland. He has been fascinated by all aspects of the UFO phenomenon since childhood and wrote his honours dissertation on alien abduction narratives in 1998, which was followed by numerous media appearances, including interviews on Today Tonight and Radio National. His most recent publication, Strategic Ignorance and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, Critiquing the Discursive Segregation of UFOs from Scientific Inquiry is the first scholarly article to critically examine how high-profile scientists discourage public interest in UFOs uh, and it appeared in Astropolitics in uh, Volume 16, Issue 1, 2018. So, we are very pleased to have you here. So, everyone, please make Dr. Adam Dodd very welcome. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Cheryl, for that very kind introduction and for your very kind invitation to speak um, about a topic I'm very, very interested in. Um, so as Cheryl explained, I teach communication and media studies at UQ, so what I'm going to attempt to do tonight is marry those two interests, so my professional interest in communication with my somewhat less than professional interest in uh, UFOs and try to explain to you the angle which is working for me at the moment in, in my attempt to write this topic into academia. I'm sure I don't need to explain to the group tonight that this is a bit of an intellectual, uh, to, an intellectual taboo around this topic. Um, academics generally tend to get quite uncomfortable when the topic is, is brought up. Um, that discomfort is something I find very interesting and I, I'm interested in where does that uh, discomfort sort of stem from and what can be done to try and overcome that. So that's what I'm going to talk mainly about tonight. Um, so you can see my email address at the bottom there. So if anything occurs to you after tonight's um, talk and you want to um, get more information or ask me questions, I welcome any, any queries to that um, email address. Okay, so I'm not actually going to talk about UFOs specifically uh, tonight, but I thought um, it will be worth sort of making my position clear on that Issue. So that's my conservative sort of working position on the topic. Um, maybe some of you share that um, position, maybe some of you are a little bit more adventurous or uh, think a little bit more sort of largely about it. Within my world, within the academic world, even that, which I consider to be, you know, quite a conservative position, is seen as uh, a bridge too far. Um, and again, the reasons for that uh, are something I'm very interested in. So I think that some, not all, not most, but some UFOs are intel intelligently controlled objects not made by humans, and that's kind of where I put the full stop um, at this point in my studies. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is sort of lead in with a few quotes from a few um, figures that are um, shaping my thinking around this topic. Um, and then, sort of in the second part of the talk, we might drill down into some examples and I'll try to demonstrate to you the kind of analysis that I'm doing um, in terms of how information about UFOs is sort of communicated. So this is a, a quote that I'm sure some of you are familiar with already. Um, the quote itself has been kind of ignored by historians, which again is kind of interesting. Um, it's not often that we have ex-directors of the CIA um, making sort of sworn um, statements to Congress about this topic, let alone making this sort of claim. Um, now, one part of it that I put in bold there, so the original statement doesn't have that, <coughs> excuse me, that bit in bold. Helen Cotter there is saying um, that he's aware of official secrecy and ridicule, okay? So the word official is the key there. So what he was suggesting as an insider is that there was some sort of coordinated scheme um, within the US government, within the US uh, military to keep certain information about UFOs secret and also to ridicule. Okay, so I would see 
a policy of secrecy and ridicule as conducive to the active production of ignorance. Okay, um, but I'm not really going to be talking so much about sort of bureaucratic or highly organised um, schemes of this kind. I'm a little bit more interested in how the ignorance manifests kind of socially, right, in an ambient way that even people who are ignorant of particular topics are kind of ignorant of their own ignorance, if that, if that makes sense. So I'll look at some examples of how I think that, that plays out um, in a moment. Um, in terms of uh, ufologists, um, Heineck is probably the one that's had the biggest impact on my own uh, thinking. Um, I think his books just sort of keep standing up. They really hold up um, uh, the more into the topic we go. Um, that was the final book that Heineck wrote or co-wrote, Night Siege. Um, and as the abstract for tonight's talk kind of indicated, um, what I've done is sort of, um, as a sort of starting point for this talk, I've, uh, I'm using um, the unpublished preface to this book. So it was one, actually one of the last things that um, J.L. and Heineck wrote before his uh, death in 1986. Um, so some of you may be aware that sort of at this stage of Heineck's career, he was you know, really fed up with essentially the ambivalence and the ignorance. So, and it's a dilemma that I think a few of us kind of share. So how can it be that we have all of this testimony, all of this evidence, and still nothing really seems to change? I think um, it often leads to sort of fantasies of some sort of big events. You know, if only a huge object would hover over a major city, everyone would be kind of forced uh, to accept what's really going on. I don't think that's likely to happen. Um, and as I say, Heineck was getting very frustrated um, by this um, at, towards the end of his uh, life. Um, so what I've got here, if you'll indulge me, I'd just like to read, read from it, um, is, as I say, Heineck's unpublished preface to this book when he's sort of laying out his thinking about um, uh, the ignorance that surrounds the topic. Um, so he's talking about the Hudson um, Valley sightings, uh, what became known as the, the boomerang. Um, so I'll just read from it and then sort of take it from there. Uh, so Heineck says, something truly astonishing happened. Not far from New York City along the Hudson Valley, as hundreds of astonished people looked up, many driving along the Taconic Parkway, they saw something no one had ever seen before. Some called it a spaceship from outer space for want of anything better but it was generally described by numbers of competent professional persons as startlingly brilliant lights in the form of a V or boomerang, silent, slow moving and uh, a very large close by object. It's often popularly been called the Westchester, uh, Westchester County boomerang. The world has never known about this, uh, even though the event happened not once but several times and over the course of several years. To all intents and purposes, this was a non-event. The media across the world has remained dumb. Local papers, radios and TVs, it's true, did momentarily carry spots uh, along with the daily news, um, but there the news just vanished. How is it possible, Heineck says, that in the United States, where even trivial events are often flashed across the world, uh, only one TV and radio network carried an account of this utterly astonishing event? Far, far lesser stories are spewing forth across the world. Could it possibly be that the whole thing just never happened? No, many times there was good but extremely local media coverage. Uh, many hundreds of, have personally attested to us and to many others that the Westchester boomerang was most undeniably very truly real to them. Furthermore, many witnesses at a given time were geographically separate and unknown to each other. Cars along the Taconic Parkway, a well-travelled highway, stopped and passengers looked in amazement, many frightened and bewildered at the spectacle. Police department blotters proved that many calls came to several local police stations and we have tape recordings of a number of the police involved. The boomerang was undeniably real, it was not a chimera. Yes, something truly and astonishing transpired, but no one was minding the store. Was everyone asleep at the switch? What about law enforcement agencies, whose duty is certainly to alert and assist when something amazing is afoot? What about civilian and military personnel, when hundreds of largely professional, affluent people in suburban areas are astonished, awestruck, and many frightened by what they could only regard as a very bizarre event, would this not at least warrant and bring forth some comment from the nation's media? And what about law officers, 
government officials, one of the Federal Aviation Authority, which supposedly monitors the airwaves over which the boomerang repeatedly flew, and thus constituted a serious hazard, especially over the Taconic Parkway. So you've got motorists being distracted by an unusual object in the sky. And what of scientists to whom these events uh, should have been of breathtaking scientific concern? But nothing except, oh yes, a rider so inept at his task that not once did he check even briefly the voluminous tapes and other material amassed by the present authors. A remarkable example of investigative reporting. It's Heineck being sarcastic. Um, his conclusion, the boomerang was caused by nothing more than a flight of small planes flying in formation. A totally untenable conclusion in view of the facts. Um, and this is where I think uh, Heineck really starts to sort of drill down into this. How it, how it would appear that we really have two astounding stories rather than just one, different but related and equally incomprehensible. The story of the low-flying luminous boomerang in itself, which could rank high in the annals of science fiction if it were science fiction, and the second, a totally unaccountable dereliction of duty, and there seems to be no other word for it, a complete superb indifference to account accountability. It was a malady which appeared to plunge all who encountered it, except the witnesses, into a deadly stupor. Such a malady, or perhaps a virulent virus of apathy and indifference to duty, could immobilise cities and a whole country. Of course, we don't know what the boomerang was, uh, was really about, because the police and other law enforcement officers were derelict and failed in their duty to assist the many who called for fear uh, and danger, as well as in awe and wonder. The FAA utterly failed to be concerned for air safety, flight rules, navigation lights, uh, when told that something utterly strange and possibly menacing uh, was cruising close over streets and houses. The military was derelict by not attending to public safety in matters of national defence. The scientists failed to uphold their Hippocratic oath of science. They were derelict in following the quest, you know, in following an outstanding mystery. And the media, well, where were they? Truly derelict, always uh, avid news hounds rushing to their typewriters or microphones to rush the news to the world, but where were they? Hardly any of the 50 states heard the boomerang story. Why? Utterly indifferent and apathetic. If so, why? Um, it continues, but I think that's going to be enough for now. But you can see the question that he's asking there. What, what are the roots of complacency? Um, so that's my kind of starting point. So that's what I want to sort of uh, delve into here. Okay. So there are a couple of other authors, as I say, who are kind of shaping my thinking here. Celia Green is someone who I uh, discovered quite recently. She wrote a book in 1969 called The Human Evasion. Um, and as the title suggests, she gets at some of these issues. So what do we ignore and, and why? Um, let me just read, um, I've got a couple of great quotes from Celia Green. Let me just begin with this one. She says, human beings live in a state of mind called sanity on a small planet in space. They're not quite sure whether the space around them is infinite or not. Either way, it is unthinkable. If they think about time, they find it inconceivable that it had a beginning. It's also inconceivable that it did not have a beginning. Thoughts of this kind are not disturbing to sanity, which is obviously a remarkable phenomena, uh, phenomenon and deserving of more recognition. A sane person believes firmly in the uselessness of thinking about what he does not understand and is pathologically interested in other people. She's writing decades before social media, I might add. Social media hasn't helped with this uh, syndrome. Um, these two symptoms at first sight independent are actually inextricably related. In fact, they are merely different aspects of that peculiar reaction to reality, which we shall call the human evasion. So there, um, Green's laying out her argument about what is the human evasion. She wants to argue that um, it's actually a avoidance of reality. Um, for example, the reality that we don't know what time is, we don't know what space is, whether it's finite or not. Those are sort of ongoing issues that affect our everyday lives. Being sane, according to Green's sort of definition involves evading those concerns, okay? And one of the ways that you can evade those concerns is to become inordinately fixated on other people, okay? Um, she continues, particular attention should be drawn to the phrase running away from reality, uh, in which reality is almost always synonymous with human beings and their affairs. Um, 
This is called anthropocentrism, a sort of inordinate focus on human beings and their concerns as if um, the universe sort of revolves around humans. For example, it isn't right to spend so much time with those stuffy old astronomy books. We could probably substitute UFO books in there if we wanted to. It's running away from reality. You ought to be getting out and meeting people. Um, an interest in any aspect of reality requiring concentrated attention in solitude is considered a particularly dangerous syndrome. <coughs> this usage leads to the interesting result that if anyone does take an interest in uh, reality, he is almost certain to be told that he is running away from it. Um, so if we can locate UFO phenomena in this thing called reality, I think what Green's saying here is helping us sort of get at um, how people evade that particular aspect of, of reality. Um, okay, so this leads me to my kind of key uh, concept here, which is the social construction of ignorance. So uh, what I want to do here is to sort of take you through an outline of, of what I mean by this. Um, what scholars are doing when they're looking at the social construction of ignorance and how I think um, rethinking ignorance can help us rethink uh, UFO phenomena. Okay. So the fancy word for this is agnotology. So agnotology is the term that was coined about 10 years ago uh, that refers to the study of the social construction of ignorance. So what does that actually mean? Um, well, uh, if you're studying the social construction of ignorance, these tend to be your key questions. So what do we ignore collectively you know, as a society? Why do we ignore it? And how do we ignore it? Okay, so maybe you can see already that this sort of way of thinking applies to topics beyond just UFOs, okay? Um, although I think UFOs present a particularly useful opportunity to sort of think in this particular way. So what do we ignore? Why do we ignore it and how? Do we ignore it? Um, a number of scholars have also started noticing that historically we've tended to ignore ignorance itself. So we've kind of ignored things that we're ignorant of, if that, if that makes sense. Um, when I bring up the UFO problem uh, with colleagues at the university, uh, almost always um, it's clear to me that they are ignorant of the topic and there are kind of valid reasons for that. Um, but they're not interested in that ignorance. So that it's sort of a double layer. They're ignoring their own ignorance and not responding usually with any sort of curiosity. Um, the key sort of point here is that ignorance is not merely the absence of knowledge. So that's the way that, at least in the Western tradition, we've tended to think about what ignorance is. Ignorance is just the absence of, of knowledge. Um, I'll, I'll drill down that a little bit more in a moment. Um, what we'd want to say, though, from an agnotological perspective, is ignorance is actively produced. Um, it's actively distributed throughout societies and also maintained. Okay, so if you're in a position of power, whether it's in the media or government or any sort of institutionalised power, and you've decided for your own purposes or the purposes of your group, a certain amount of ignorance of a certain topic is necessarily undesirable, there are strategies that you can implement to achieve that. Um, but importantly, that pattern of ignorance needs to be maintained. Usually you can't just rely on it um, maintaining itself. It's kind of like a building or anything that's constructed. You can build it very well and it can be very strong and solid, but if you don't regularly maintain it, it's going to start to come apart. Okay? So what I'm suggesting is ignorance functions in that, in that kind of way too. Um, so in the, again, in the Western tradition, these are sort of familiar concepts for, that we use to describe epochs of knowledge in European history. So we have this idea of the Dark Ages. So, and then um, later in the 15th century, sorry, 18th century, um, what's referred to as the Enlightenment. So you've got metaphors of light being used to help us think about knowledge and ignorance. Okay, so that's telling you something I think kind of interesting. Ignorance, from this perspective, is just like darkness, the absence of light. Um, knowledge is like light. So the message there is, as we build more and more knowledge, we're kind of eradicating the darkness and filling up um, what used to be dark with light. Okay? Um, we see this playing out in popular culture all the time. We often talk about having a light bulb moment, you know, when you get an idea. Um, why is it that we use light to sort of metaphorically stand for knowledge or, or ideas? Um, we won't get into that now, but I just wanted to point out that this way of thinking about ignorance and knowledge has actually been a bit of a barrier because it's, it's, it's made a kind of 
difficult, if not impossible, to think about ignorance in the ways that I'm suggesting here. So within this field of agnotology, this is sort of seen as like one of the big sort of turning points, literally rethinking the way we've thought about ignorance and addressing our own ignorance of, of ignorance. Um, now, one more sort of thing I'd want to point out here, because it's often um, it's easy to sort of overlook. Ignorance um, is often desirable. Um, it's often necessary. Okay, so think about interpersonal relationships. It's actually necessary for, for your relationship with friends, family or acquaintances to remain ignorant of certain things about the other person. It would kind of drive you crazy if you knew everything about everyone. Okay? Um, so it's functional. Um, ignorance is actually often highly functional. Um, so at the level of individuals, a certain amount of ignorance is, is necessarily functional. But in terms of organisations, um, if we had more time tonight, I'd, I'd talk a little bit about my take on the US Air Force's UFO policy up until the late 60s. They often cop some you know, bad rap for sort of ignoring UFOs. Um, I kind of think, well, I can understand where they were coming from because in order to function as an organisation, all of the members have to make decisions about what they're going to admit, what information are we going to acknowledge and let in and work with, and what information do we need to keep out. Okay, that's just what defines an organisation. And the US Air Force at the time, I don't think had the resources or the energy or the motivation to admit information about UFOs into the organisation. So they had to make a kind of strategic decision to remain ignorant. Um, unfortunately, there were no other organisations to kind of pick up that, that task and it kind of took a dive, um, as many of you would know, in the late 60s. Um, now, ignorance, as I'm sort of talking about it here, is also associated with stupidity. So this is another topic that's sort of getting a bit of academic attention in recent years as well. So stupidity not used as an insult, not in a derogatory sense, but in this sense, the, the inability and or the unwillingness to learn or think critically and reflect, reflectively. Um, so I think we need to acknowledge that stupidity, excuse me, as I define it there, does exist, okay? Um, now, um, I've suggested there that ignorance can be functional, okay? Stupidity can be functional as well. So if you'll um, indulge me, I just want to say a few things about stupidity and then bring things back into um, the UFO topic. So um, Matt Salverson is a Swedish um, uh, professor of psychology uh, who has a visiting professorship at UQ actually, and he co-wrote this book called The Stupidity Paradox with Andre Spicer, um, two of my favorite authors. Um, here you've got um, Alberson, uh, laying, Alberson and Spicer laying out what they mean by functional stupidity. Um, so they say, to understand why smart people buy into stupid ideas and often get rewarded for doing so, um, we need to look at the role that functional stupidity plays. Functional stupidity is the inclination to reduce one's scope of thinking and focus only on the narrow technical aspects of the job. You do the job correctly, but without reflecting on purpose or the wider context. Functional stupidity is an organ of people from thinking seriously about what they do at work. When people are seized by functional stupidity, they remain capable of doing the job, but they stop asking searching questions about their work. In the place of rigorous reflection, they become obsessed with superficial appearances. Instead of asking questions, they start to obey commands. Rather than think about outcomes, they focus on the techniques for getting things done. And the things to be done, uh, and the thing to be done is often to create the right impression. Someone in the thrall of functional stupidity is great at doing things that look good. They tick boxes for management, please the clients and placate the authorities, but they also do things that make little sense and that a sharp outside <coughs> observer might find strange. Um, there's a lot more in the book, obviously, than that, but that's a nice, succinct summary of, of what they mean by functional stupidity. Um, the book is based on hours and hours of, sort of ethnographic um, field research. So Alberson, in particular, spends a lot of time in organisations observing how those organisations are, uh, are organised, how people behave in corporate, government, university settings, and that led him to this concept of functional stupidity. You might think that, oh, don't organisations just have this natural sort of filtering mechanism that, that punishes or excludes st stupid behaviour, the opposite is actually true. Um, when you look closely at um, many organisations in what Alveson calls post-affluent societies, like Australia, the US, Western Europe, 
stupidity is not only tolerated but often rewarded in those organisations. Um, this kind of functional stupidity tends to ignore any organisational problems because people who draw attention to problems in organisations run the risk of being seen as kind of like rocking the boat or being a bit depressing to be around. If you can ignore all of those problems and maintain a happy countenance and make things look good, you tend to be rewarded in an organisation and tend to be promoted. Of course, that just puts a band-aid over organisational problems. The problems don't go away just because they're ignored. If anything, they get worse, they fester, then they can sort of erupt and have devastating uh, results on an organisation. Um, Alveson's prime example of that is the 2008 financial crisis, where you had lots of banks practising functional stupidity. All of these economic wunderkinds were, do this, do this, you can make all of this money. The bankers didn't really understand these new rules that allowed them to profit immensely in a short period of time, but they just went along with it. Of course, it was an unsustainable um, system. It collapsed and um, we're still sort of recovering from the effects of that today. Um, one more thing I'll say about this before I move on. The book is just about workplace environments, but I think what they're talking about there, we can see echoes of that in sort of social interaction as well. Um, if we had more time, we could talk about how sort of social life is sort of starting to mirror or echo the kinds of bureaucratic structures we see in corporate environments, but that might be a, a talk for another time. Okay. All right, so this is what I'm saying about ignorance. Um, ignorance should be understood as a social and psychological phenomenon that's facilitated by language use. So this is where I'm sort of tying it into my professional interest in communication. Um, why do I say this? Well, it's primarily through language that we help ourselves and each other to ignore things, such as UFOs, that we would prefer not to think about. Okay? I think it's hard to understand how ignorance functions without looking closely at language. So we want to say there's a, a language of ignorance. We can sort of talk things out of the way in the same way that we can talk things in. Okay, so I think the value of a group like this is we can sort of gather, talk about these things called UFOs and sort of help to realise or reaffirm that something mysterious is occurring. But of course, if it's possible to do that, it's possible to do the opposite as well, isn't it? And sort of talk things out of the way. Um, so that's, that's what I'm interested in. Okay, so the language of ignorance. Um, I've taught a course at UQ uh, several times called Communication and Rhetoric. Uh, sadly, it's been discontinued, but it was a very popular course while it was offered. And what we did in that course was introduce students to the classic methods of rhetoric. So in the, Greek, in the ancient Greek sense, self-conscious persuasive language use. Um, so this is super interesting to students studying journalism or marketing. Um, the ways uh, in which language is used to persuade us of certain things, okay? Um, so self-conscious and persuasive language use, that's what we mean by rhetoric. Um, we can break this down into two sort of components when we're thinking about language in this way. The first is what the Greeks called invention. So there um, we're addressing what is said, so the actual content of a message or um, an article or an advertisement or whatever. And style is how it's said. So if you want to understand how someone is using language against you or on you to try and shape your thinking, in fact, it's what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to sort of convince you of certain things, um, this is how we would do it. Not just what's said, so what is this person saying to me, but how is it said, okay? Um, and getting that content form balance um, can be super useful. Um, the question of style is essential to rhetoric. So its guiding assumption is that the form in which something is communicated um, is as much a part of the message as the content. Okay. Um, so for example, politicians, evangelists, celebrity scientists, um, some of whom I'll, I'll get to a little bit later in the talk, um, all use language to persuade their audiences to ignore things. Okay. Um, I don't know if we have any Trump supporters in the room or not, um, whether we do or not, just, doesn't really matter. But he's a good example of this because the actual content of much of what um, Trump says publicly is kind of nonsensical or illogical. And you might think, well, how can he, how can he build and maintain support when the content of his um, speeches are so kind of empty or contradictory or um, incoherent? Well, the answer part, partly to that is um, the form, his delivery. 
I mean, if you've ever watched uh, American televangelists, you start you see something quite similar going on in those. This is what they're saying. Sometimes they, they actually just start sort of babbling and speaking in tongues. The content doesn't matter. <coughs> the, the form is what matters. It's about engendering a feeling in your audience. Um, so I don't think most Donald Trump supporters who attend the rallies are there for sort of um, close intellectual insight into particular topics. They're there to get a certain feeling. <coughs> and in the same way that ev televangelists sort of whip up a feeling in their audience or musicians or whoever, um, politicians can do the same thing as well. <coughs> and given the diversity of how people talk and think about UFO phenomena, I think something like that is playing out in, in that sort of space also. Okay, um, logical fallacies. So I see logical fallacies as being really foundational to how ignorance is, is produced and maintained. Let me just say a few things about what I mean by logical fallacies. So, um, Technically speaking, uh, a logical fallacy is this, a uh, common error in reasoning that undermines an argument's logic. All I mean by logic here is, is this, if X, then Y. So a simple equation. If this proposition is true, then we can logically draw this conclusion. Um, that's, uh, at least in the Western tradition, we tend to be more persuaded by arguments that are logical. Not everyone is. In fact, you could even make the observation that we're kind of departing in some ways from that, but traditionally that's, that's what a logical argument is. Um, illegitimate arguments or irrelevant points, often lacking supporting evidence, tend to be uh, logical fallacies. Um, this is where I think it gets kind of interesting. An argument may be logically fallacious, but it can still triumph if the fallacies are persuasive. Um, as I get closer to these um, videos of some high profile scientists, I think you'll see this playing out in those instances. One of the great myths of science, I think, um, is that it's kind of um, immutably logical. So when you have figures like um, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Cox, uh, Stephen Hawking, who we'll come to in a moment, um, who um, take on sort of high profile public roles, partly to educate the public about science, partly to convince the public that they should side with science over other belief systems, they tend to enter those spaces with the assumption that what we're telling you is logical. I'm performing science for you, a non-scientist, so look at how I do it, look at how I think about certain topics, and if you emulate my method, you will be seen as a scientific uh, thinker by your peers. So we live in a kind of secular society, we often feel a kind of certain amount of pressure, I guess, to adopt a scientific worldview rather than a superstitious worldview. Um, figures like Hawking and, and Tyson and others provide examples for us um, how to do that. How do I think scientifically about um, a particular topic? Um, what's interesting is that when you really start to scrutinise, particularly the public statements made by those scientists about UFOs, they're full of logical fallacies. Um, but uh, the arguments tend to be persuasive. Like, I think a lot of people would look at Stephen Hawking or Tyson and go, yeah, that's a scientific uh, take on the UFO phenomenon. I'm convinced by that. Without realising that logically those, what they're saying doesn't actually hold up. Um, so if we have time, we'll, we'll look at those in a moment. So the kind of depressing conclusion there is that winning an argument is not always the same as arriving at the truth. If you've, I'm sorry to keep coming back to politics, I'm kind of obsessed with it, but if you've been following the impeachment trial in, in, in the US, um, you can see exactly that sort of going on. It's kind of like, I like the analogy of like playing chess against a pigeon. You know, you're not going to win because in the end the pigeon's just going to knock all the pieces over and fly away. When you're having an argument with someone who is departing from logic, that's kind of what it's like. You're not playing the same game. Okay. Um, okay, and these are just a few of the really common ones, and you can see this going on all the time, particularly in um, arguments against the veracity of UFO phenomenon. So often um, the individual is attacked rather than the idea or the evidence. So we're all familiar with UFO witnesses or UFO promon proponents being sort of um, represented or attacked as like kooks or crackpots or crazy or whatever. That's an ad hominem attack. A straw man is arguing uh, against an oversimplified or otherwise distorted version. Um, I've got some good examples of Hawking using straw man arguments um, uh, that we'll get to in a moment. And slippery slopes were less common, but claiming that a single event will inevitably give rise to a chain of future events. These happen all the time in, in um, 
argumentation by people who really should know better. Um, but as I suggested earlier, um, persuading someone of your position um, doesn't always require logic. Like if you think your audience is more likely to be persuaded by an illogical claim or argument, you can use that and you can triumph. Okay? I'm old fashioned, I still think logic should be adhered to. Um, okay, so we're getting closer to my um, examples. Um, this is sort of my claim here. So the ways in which, uh, and this is also the claim that I made in the, the article that, that Cheryl mentioned that I published a couple of years ago. Uh, the ways in which many scientists publicly address the topic of UFOs uh, exemplify the powerful role that language plays in the social construction of ignorance. So what I've done there is take a, a, um, a sample of lots of different statements made by, excuse me, famous scientists and sort of said, well, um, they're actually advocating ignorance and they're closing down curiosity. How can that, how do they get a free pass doing that? Isn't, don't we expect the opposite from scientists? Um, and again, that's something that sort of baffles me. Even guys like Tyson, who we'll look at in a moment, will kind of admit, yeah, yeah, um, there are UFOs, we, don't, we just don't know what they are. So, you know, don't start thinking about alien spaceships. Remind people, he always says, what the U stands for. I'm like, yeah, that's a valid point. The U does stand for identified. But you're a scientist with a well-known interest in space. You've just admitted that there's an anomalous phenomenon occurring. We don't know what it is. Aren't you supposed to be attracted to mysteries, to problems? Why are you not drawn closer to that problem that you just admitted exists? Um, so that's, those sort of questions are what's sort of motivating me. Um, so a few more key points here. Um, science needs rhetoric as a means of expression in order to inform, disinform. We don't often think of science as disinforming audiences, but I, I would say that it does on occasion. Science can misinform, um, persuade or motivate particular audiences in specific situations. Um, the construction of UFOs is a non-phenomenon, so this idea that there's actually nothing going on um, like external to witnesses. So yeah, there might be something going on, but it's just like some sort of collective delusion, which even the psychologists aren't curious about explaining. Um, I would say that results from cumulative, so you know, accruing over time, rhetorical acts of marginalization. <coughs> um, ignorance of UFOs is socially constructed rather than just natural or inevitable. Um, high profile scientists sometimes see the topic of UFOs as an opportunity to undertake um, what sociologists call face work or, or boundary work. Um, so one of my questions going into the paper was why do scientists bother saying anything about UFOs at all? Hawking in particular, um, he gave a TED talk in 2008 which we might look at um, in a moment and I thought um, who would go to a Stephen Hawking event or a Neil deGrasse Tyson event or Brian Cox or whatever and come away from it thinking that was pretty good but he didn't talk about UFOs at all? Maybe a small number of people in, in an audience would, would be dissatisfied. But generally speaking, it's totally okay for scientists to just not talk about UFOs. So why put any effort at all into doing it, particularly Stephen Hawking? Well, it turns out there's a theory in sociology that helps us explain why those moments occur. Um, and that's uh, boundary work. So a sociologist of science called Thomas Gearan in the early 80s, who wanted to understand how does science like happen in societies? Um, he was one of the earliest scholars to start thinking about science as a social production. So rather than science being this sort of universal system of knowledge that sort of um, nothing to do really with human beings or society. It's just like this in a vacuum or something. He did the opposite. He said, well, actually, no. If you want to understand what science is and the types of knowledge that science produces and the types of things that science closes down, you have to see science as a product of the society in which it occurs. Because different societies have different ways of making knowledge. Okay? And I don't think you would want to claim that um, it just so happens that I live in a Western society and it turns out that my society has the best system of producing knowledge and all the traditional or indigenous systems of knowledge are sort of primitive or they just need to catch up to what we're doing. It's, it's, it's um, not really how scholars think about knowledge anymore. 
Um, so that's part of it. Boundary work is um, referring to the way that scientists create and maintain a boundary around science so that they can actually distinguish between what counts as science and what counts as non-science or, or what's pseudoscience. Okay? Um, it's not always obvious or clear what counts as science and what counts as non-science. That boundary, here I would say, has to be actively produced and maintained. So when someone like Hawking in a public setting starts talking about UFOs to discourage public <coughs> interest in it, um, what he's doing is boundary work. He's bringing a topic into the discussion only to dismiss it with the intention that, okay, now that I've done that, the audience has a better understanding of what counts as science and what, um, what doesn't. Face work is uh, something similar to boundary work. Um, Irving Goffman was a um, very influential American sociologist interested in interpersonal communication. He uh, came up with this um, idea of face work, which is um, the measures that individuals take to maintain, to create and maintain a, a persona. So face, not just meaning the, the front of your head, but your persona. So when we say saving face, after you do something embarrassing, that's what Goffman's talking about. So we have a, an idealised persona that we construct. Usually it's made up of what we think are approved social attributes. Um, so what are my good qualities? What, what qualities do I have that are likely to be appealing to others? Well, we foreground those and we tend to sort of push to the back or um, um, Goffman said the backstage, the less desirable um, qualities of ourselves. Um, this is just something that Goffman said we all do. It's part of just social interaction. He was writing this in the 50s, decades before this thing called Facebook um, emerged. But if Goffman was around now, he'd be looking at Facebook going, see, this is exactly what I said was going on. You think it's called Facebook because you're encouraged to put pictures of your face on it. Goffman would say, no, Facebook is a, a platform for doing face work. Put all the pictures of you on exciting holidays or drinking at cool bars with your friends and don't put pictures of yourself crying in the bathroom because you broke up with your boyfriend or whatever. So foreground the approved attributes and push the negative ones to the back. Scientists do this, okay? So when someone like Hawking wants to perform science for an audience, he's um, putting on his face. I'm the scientist, okay? Um, but we can penetrate that facade, I think, and um, get a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes. And I find laughter itself very interesting. Um, no one really likes being laughed at when you're not making a joke. Um, and the jury's still kind of out on what laughter actually is, um, because apart from kookaburras, who I don't think really, that's not really a laugh, I, I think homo sapiens are the only species that do this. And we're still not quite sure why. Probably there's more than one reason for laughter. Um, but from a psychological perspective, and I think Freud wrote a little bit about this, um, Laughter can arise as a way of kind of shedding a nervous tension that arises from uncomfortable thoughts. Um, so sometimes we have nervous laughter, okay? Why does that happen? <clears throat> well, partly it helps sort of, yeah, let, let go of that nervous tension that uncomfortable thoughts can provoke. Um, if you think about the structure of a traditional joke that prompts laughter, usually the reason it's funny is because we're being taken in one direction and the punchline reverses direction or goes off on an unexpected tangent. So when we encounter information that kind of disrupts us, laughter often occurs. Um, that's not the kind of laughter though that we see in the examples. I think um, when scientists are sort of talking about UFOs in ways that elicit laughter from the audience, um, they're doing it to kind of laugh off the topic. So talk about UFOs in a particular way, elicit laughter from the audience, that creates a kind of communal agreement. Oh, yep, we're all on the same page, and then you move on. So it's, it can be used in a dismissive way, I think, <coughs> laughter, um, which I find um, really interesting. Richard Feynman. I had a conversation about flying thoughts some years ago with Lane. Because I'm scientifically in all about flying thoughts. So I said, I don't think there are flying thoughts. So the other, my antagonist said, is it impossible that there are flying forces? Can you prove that it's impossible? I mean, no, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely. That, they say, you are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then why, how can you say it's likely that it's unlikely? Well, that's the way that is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's more likely and less likely and not to be proving all the time possible and impossible. 
To define what I mean, I finally said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the result of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence rather than the unknown rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> Okay, so that's an interesting example because uh, Feynman was a very sort of accomplished, what we would now call a science communicator, so quite good at sort of convincing people of science and of the value of science. Um, you might think, well, doesn't everyone just sort of automatically know that science is valuable and sort of a worthwhile pursuit and, and maybe preferable to superstition? No, actually, um, it'd be nice if, if that was the case, maybe, but, but it's not. Um, even in the US, you know, there's this idea that science uh, somehow replaced religion. Now we're all on board. Well, if you look at the surveys, it's last time I checked, 49% of all American adults believe that the Earth is 3,000, 5,000 years old, um, rather than much older and characterised by um, evolution. Um, so this idea that science is sort of one and doesn't require any ongoing effort to convince people of its veracity is a bit of a myth. Um, but you can see there Feynman not really doing much to help us think about UFOs, but um, got a laugh out of the crowd and sort of put people at ease. So that was 1960. What counts as extraordinary is often sort of implicitly defined as that which is constantly out of reach. So this kind of infinitely receding horizon. So until we have a crash flying saucer or until we have an alien body or until we have an armada hovering over a major city, we don't have the extraordinary evidence. There is no scientifically agreed upon definition of extraordinary, okay? So it just doesn't work. It's, it's actually not a scientific um, sort of formulation. You might have also noticed quite subtle Sagan saying not what one or two witnesses. So it's like, yeah, I think there's been more than one or two. So Sagan was very deliberately using language there. And um, it's something I find very interesting about um, Sagan in particular. Um, he, you know, in the 50s, he was very, very open to the idea of um, of uh, UFOs being extraterrestrial. Wrote a few papers on this about um, his, his certainty that there was like a galactic community um, made up of space um, exploring civilizations and so on. Um, but then something changed in his sort of, I think it coincided with his increased public profile into the 1960s. In fact, there was a, a drama series called Dark Skies in the 90s that had a character playing Carl Sagan that played out that idea that he was sort of um, groomed by intelligence agencies to take on this sort of debunking role. Maybe that happened, maybe not. Maybe it's just Sagan doing face work. This is how I establish myself as a reputable scientist. But to deliberately um, mislead or mischaracterise the evidence, I think um, we can't just give him a pass on that. Like he knew what he was doing and he made the choice to mislead the public about the true um, scope of the data, of the, of the evidence. Um, okay. Okay, let's go to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Let's start. UFO sightings, here you go. You ready? Ready, all right. Someone says they saw a UFO. Remind them what the U stands for, okay? <laughs> Unidentified. Because then they say, I saw a UFO. I said, oh, what did it look like? Oh. It was like a spaceship, and it landed from another planet. And then, and I said, well, you just said you didn't know what it was because you said it was unidentified. And so we have this urge, this irrational urge, which we all know is called argument from ignorance, where you don't know something, and then you invent something. You go from not knowing anything to knowing everything about it, just by an invention of a, of a comment or a thought. So what I found when people claim they've seen a UFO, you just get them to describe it. And then you get them to the edge where they then want to say it's an alien. And then you simply tell them, you started out by saying you did not know what it was. End of conversation. You have no evidence to say that you know what it is. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you want to get abducted, that's the fun part. So, they get abducted. Now they tell you that they were abducted. You tell them, I'm sorry, your eyewitness testimony is not worth anything to me. Because no matter what eyewitness testimony is in the court of law, 
it is the lowest form of evidence in the court of science. And so you need something better than that. So the next time, here's what you do. So you tell the person, here's what you do. You tell them, next time you're abducted, and they're doing the sex experiments, right? You're on the little slab, because this is what aliens do when they abduct you, and they're poking your organs. This is what you do. Tell the aliens, hey, look over there, right? And quickly grab something off the shelf that's on the spaceship, an ashtray or something. I don't know, no matter what, okay? Because I can tell you, no matter, if they flew here from another galaxy, no matter what you pull off the shelf, it'll be some unlike anything we have here on Earth. There is stuff we have among us that was unlike anything else on Earth five years ago, three years ago, two years ago. Okay, I pull out my iPhone, there's- Sorry, I can't handle any more. You're <laughs> very, very irritating. Um, but just in that short few minutes, you can see a lot of what I was, so, um, uh, ridicule, straw man, um, it's all kind of there and, um, really more in common with the stand-up comedy routine than uh, an honest, sort of open, curious, scientific take on the topic. But I think, you know, this is what I mean by the social construction of ignorance. I think probably Tyson was successful based on the here of the audience here and sort of convincing people. I don't think the people in the audience here really wanted to probe deeply into the UFO mystery. I think they wanted someone to help them laugh it off so that they could focus on the more serious parts of, you know, um, what's going on in, in space. Um, even the implicit echoing Sagan there, the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So I guess Tyson would say, if you could get an ashtray from inside a flying saucer when you've been abducted, that's the kind of extraordinary evidence. I mean, that's just so fundamentally unscientific. And he, he repeated that um, point in numerous sort of occasions around the same time. It was kind of his, his bit. Um, again, not helping the public to think about that topic at all and I would say actively um, fostering ignorance. Um, okay, another particularly high profile scientist, Martin Rees, um, very, very old school astronomer. Um, let's have a listen to how he chooses to talk about well, UFOs in public. It's simple life is common, and it exists on many planets around other stars. It's of course a separate question, whether it is likely to evolve into anything we might recognize as intelligent or complex. That's a separate question. Of course, some people already know, those who've uh, seen UFOs or been abducted. And in the UK, where I have the title of Astronomer Royal, I get quite a lot of letters from these people. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I tell them, isn't it a pity that uh, uh, these um, aliens um, came here and uh, all they did was despoil a few cornfields, making corn circles, mm -hmm. met a few well-known cr cranks and went away again. Um, and I tend to get these people to write to each other rather than the right to me. Okay. Again, I just find that like stunningly dismissive, mm -hmm. completely devoid of any curiosity, and even the, the body language, you can sort of see him literally just waving the topic um, away. Um, referring to corn circles rather than, I mean, I think they're known as crop circles, but no one says corn circles. Yeah. But again, for the audience, that's enough. I think most people in the room on that occasion were looking for someone like Rees, um, Astronomer Royal, um, you know, no small uh, title, to give them um, the assurance that they can just laugh this off. Okay, and uh, that topic wasn't returned to after Rees devoted the 20 seconds to sort of hit it, dismiss it, and move on. Um, okay, so what we're seeing is a pattern, I think, of, of ignorance here. The age old question, really. I mean, because is there anything out there? The, the question is, where are these other civilizations? Because they should be there. Because mm. our galaxy, there's something like 400 billion stars in our galaxy. We've been discovering in the last few years that there are planetary systems everywhere we look. We found a couple of Earth-like planets, rocky planets at the right temperature for water. The galaxy has been around for 11 billion years. Mm. Now the Earth has only been around for four and a half billion. So there's been so much time, and there are so many planets, so many solar systems, that you would think that one of them had been able to build spacecraft and, and get out there and explore, and we see no evidence for them. And one of the ideas is maybe they're around, but maybe we just don't recognise them. But what about the, the idea of... Um... I'm not saying that there, there's no evidence, I've got to say, this is not UFO nonsense. Yeah. There, no UFOs have ever landed, no one's been abducted, it's all bollocks. You don't... <laughs> 
again, like super interesting moment. I'm pretty sure that most scientists would agree that making a claim like that, it's all bollocks, um, is not part of scientific discourse. Um, yet, um, on that, in this particular instance, it seems to be acceptable. Um, but I think if you scrutinise it, you can also see that Cox is not very, his thoughts about this topic are not actually very well formed. So he sort of started with that familiar um, Fermi paradox, you know, if, um, where are they? Where is everybody? Um, but then he says, well, maybe they're around, but we just don't recognise them. And then almost preempting, he'd open the door there to, well, there are these things called UFOs. Maybe that's what you're talking about, things that we don't recognise, but then immediately sort of shuts the door on that. Um, and again, even if it is the case that there are no uh, genuine physical anomalies in space collectively called UFOs, we still have a mystery, which is why do so many people think that there is, okay? And that might be a question for the psychiatrist or the psychologists or the social psychologists, but we see no curiosity whatsoever in explaining even that um, uh, possibility, okay? Either it's external or it's internal. We have professionals who are very uh, skilled in addressing internal psychological phenomena, external physical phenomena. Neither um, group wants to put their hand up and, and take it on. Okay, so um, the last video is Hawking. So this is from a TED uh, address he gave in 2008. He chose to speak for about one minute on the UFO topic in a talk that went for, uh, I think, about half an hour. This is what sort of got me started when I, it took me four years to write the paper and then three years to get it published. There's a whole sort of backstory there, the reasons given by editors for not even sending it out for review I found interesting in terms of, you know, what I've been saying here. But it was this talk from Hawking that really drew my attention to this issue. How high profile scientists who have a lot of influence in our society um, talk about this particular topic. Um, and in the paper I sort of established, well yeah, there is a, actually a pattern to this that you can see going back decades, even back to the, the 60s, um, like a formula. A formula that scientists use to discourage public interest in, in UFOs and to sort of discourage any sort of curiosity. Issuing an insurance policy against abduction by aliens seems a pretty safe bet. We're going for laugh there, but the delivery was a little bit off. You can imagine, for obvious reasons, but you can imagine someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson saying the same words and probably prompting um, a bit of laughter. So to close this off, I thought what I would do is just um, look very closely at what, sorry, what Hawking actually said there. So he said a few things. Let me just take it um, line by line. This will be my last sort of example, just to um, give you a sense of um, how I think closely studying languages helps us to understand how ignorance is, is produced. This is what he says to begin with. On the other hand, we don't seem to have been visited by aliens. Um, there's a few things I'd want to say in response to that claim. So it begins with an idiom. Um, on the other hand, it's kind of a, a useful way to begin a sentence. It sort of creates the impression that, oh yeah, I'm sort of, I'm balanced in my perspective. I've considered both sides of the story. He clearly hasn't, but he talks as if he has. Um, but there's a logical fallacy there, something you would not expect from a scientist as accomplished as Stephen Hawking. And we were reminded of this by Neil deGrasse Tyson, ironically enough, it's called the argument from ignorance. Um, absence of evidence is equated with evidence of absence. Now any scientist will say, just because you don't have evidence of something doesn't mean you can prove that it doesn't exist, it just means you don't have the evidence yet. To make that even clearer, um, it'd be like saying we don't have the murder weapon, therefore no murder weapon was used. Well no, you, you can't show that no murder weapon was used, you just haven't found the weapon yet. Like no cop would go, well, I guess there was no murder weapon because we haven't found it. Hawking is doing the same logical fallacy but applying it to UFOs. Um, he's also, and this is more subtle I think, evoking a particular kind of alien visitation, okay? And the particular kind that he's evoking is overt contact, okay? So we could even debate whether that's occurred or not, okay? But let's say for argument's sake it hasn't. Let's say nothing that we could call overt um, contact has occurred. Um, he's he's um, singularly focused on that particular form of visitation and excluding any others, and then dismissing the concept of visitation because that particular one hasn't demonstrably occurred. We haven't had the big mothership of New York City, therefore 
there's been no visitation. Um, other logically possible scenarios such as covert or secretive visitation okay, um, are not even addressed. Now, it's sort of a hypothetical to put yourself in the minds of extraterrestrial intelligence. What form would it take? What would they do if they were here and so on? Um, but I think the big sort of picture, if you look at all of the evidence that's been gathered over the last 70 years, um, my interpretation uh, is it seems to suggest a kind of covert surveillance. Okay, and even that might be saying a little bit too much. There's certainly no clear attempts to invade or colonise, um, at least not, not visibly. Um, but I think it's a logical mistake to say because there's been no overt contact, that there's been no visitation at all. They're, they're not the same thing. It's a false equivalence. Um, the false equivalence being visitation equals overt contact. So because we haven't had the big Hollywood scenario, it hasn't happened. Um, I think that's a mistake. It's, it's actually logically fallacious. Um, and that's kind of cut off at the bottom there, but the word we, so um, linguists are very interested in the function of specific words and sentences. Um, they're often sort of operating on us unconsciously, but I would want to say, who's we? So when you say, we don't seem to have been visited, are you just assuming that everyone agrees with you, that you just speak on behalf of, like, do you mean all human beings living, deceased, like, ever? Or do you just mean you and your scientific friends? Or it's, it's, not, it's not clear, but it, it sort of builds and assumes a rapport with your audience. Okay, that's how the word we often function. So you can get away with convincing people of particular things by using that word. Then he says this, I am discounting the reports of UFOs. Okay, what's he doing with that utterance? Well, um, to declare that one is discounting the reports of UFOs is basically tantamount to discounting all reports of UFOs. Think about what he's actually achieving with that sentence. I'm discounting the reports of UFOs. What he really means is, I am discounting all reports of UFOs. Um, the same meaning, but the phrasing is quite different, okay? Um, saying I am discounting the reports rather than I am discounting all reports minimises the magnitude of the statement. And I think it, it makes it more persuasive. If you came out and said, I'm discounting all reports of UFOs, in other words, every report that's been made from every witness over the last seven decades, I'm discounting all of it. Probably some people in the audience would go, really? Like that's a, that's a lot of stuff just to throw, throw out. Isn't there anything in there that's like worthy of your curiosity? Um, so that very subtle phrasing can be very, very powerful. Um, to discount, of course, all reports is to dismiss an abundance of data prior to investigation or a priori. And scientists do this quite a lot when it comes to this particular topic. Okay. They haven't looked at it, but they, they're quite comfortable dismissing all of it. Um, <clears throat> so there we, we would want to, I think, make a distinction between rejection and dismissal. Uh, rejection suggests a conclusion based on a close examination, which is what scientists sort of should do. Um, in this case, scientists don't reject UFO phenomena, they dismiss it. It's not the same thing. Dismissal is an a priori judgment that close examination is not warranted. Okay? Now in, in some instances, you might say, well, that's actually a legitimate position to take for a scientist. In the case of, I don't know, flying spaghetti monsters, just to, like if someone claims that they exist, I think we could forgive scientists for going, I'm going to dismiss that a priori. I, I don't have the time or the methods or the interest actually to follow that up, your claim that there are flying spaghetti monsters. Um, that's nothing like UFO phenomena, okay? Um, so dismissal and rejection are not the same thing. What Hawking is doing there is dismissing. And remember, he's acting as an example of science. He's, uh, while he was alive, kind of the most famous scientist on Earth. Um, a kind of personification of this thing called science. So lots of people looking to Hawking for an example about how do I think scientifically about certain topics. Um, and he's really letting the public down, I think, in this instance, because he's departing from some of the fundamental tenets of, of science. Then he launches an ad hominem attack. This, I think, is an astounding statement for such a high-profile pro, high scientist. Why would they appear only to cranks 
and weirdo. So he's insulting UFO witnesses. He's, he's sort of admonishing them. Um, he's also phrasing what's called a rhetorical question, which is a question that's not intended to be answered. And that can be very powerful rhetorically as well, because when you ask a rhetorical question, you're kind of assuming that the audience agrees with you. It's a nice day today, isn't it? That sort of thing, okay? Why would they appear only to cranks and weirdos? Demonstrably untrue, okay? Even if we agree that there are these people in society called cranks and weirdos, um, what about the witnesses who fly expensive military aircraft or fly planes with hundreds of passengers in them who say they see UFOs, okay? Are they cranks and weirdos? Because if they are, maybe someone should look into that. Maybe it's a problem if we have cranks and weirdos flying hundreds of people around in the sky. Again, Hawking, not interested in following that up at all. Um, so the rhetorical question too, just as a kind of figure of speech, often functions as a statement. Okay, so what's he actually saying? He's not really asking a question, he's making a statement. The statement is, UFOs appear only to cranks and weirdos. And again, like the previous utterance, if he'd phrased in that way, the true meaning of what he's, he's, he's uh, sort of saying would register and it would be less persuasive because you risk the audience going, oh, really? Um, they only appear to cranks and weirdos. Um, yeah, okay, uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, the rhetorical question as a sort of device, as a persuasive device, also includes an emotional dimension. So we call this pathos, the appeal to emotion. Politicians use it all the time. And it expresses a kind of mild indignation or sarcasm. Why would they appear only to cranks and weirdos? Martin Rees did something similar with his, isn't it a pity uh, that they come all this way and all they do is meet a, a few well-known cranks um, and go away? And again, rhetorical question, quite sarcastic, but used appropriately can sort of um, endear you to the audience, okay? Um, because um, if you convince the audience to feel like you're feeling, Laughter is one way you can sort of do this. You build a rapport and you're more likely to, um, to persuade them. Um, we have an ad hominem attack again. So cranks and weirdos are an attack on um, someone's character, which casts doubt on their, their intellect or their sanity or their, their credibility. It also kind of induces a circular reasoning, okay, fundamentally unscientific. The circular reasoning here is people who see UFOs are cranks and weirdos because they see UFOs. How do you get out of that? You can't. Okay, you're trapped in the cycle of cranks and weirdos because you see um, or say that you've seen UFOs. And this, again, the most subtle part, I think, of that statement is sort of look at the words he's using. People don't see UFOs. UFOs appear to them, which suggests that UFOs are kind of like apparitions. So there's actually an important difference between seeing something and having something appear to you. So if you're of unsound mind and you're prone to hallucinations or whatever, you're seeing appearances, apparitions. You're not really seeing something, you're having a hallucination. That's the angle that Hawking's kind of working here. He doesn't even give witnesses the credit of seeing something unusual. They're just appearances, okay? So a lot going on in just a very short sentence when you start to you know, really sort of scrutinize. Then he says this, if there is a government conspiracy to suppress the reports and keep for itself the knowledge the aliens bring, it seems to have been a singularly ineffective policy so far. What's he doing there? Well, this is called an association fallacy. Okay, so um, associating things that don't really belong together. If there is a government conspiracy, um, the implication is that UFO pr proponents are conspiracy theorists. So that's like tarring you with, with the brush, right? Um, which means paranoid, uh, mentally unstable and thus not to be taken seriously. And it's a very persistent stereotype in the UFO world. Okay, you, you're into UFOs, you must be a conspiracy theorist. He also made this statement two years later in his documentary series, Into the Universe. If governments are involved in a cover-up, they're doing a much better job at it than they seem to do at anything else. I could agree with that. Yeah, but it's like, pick a side, Stephen. Like, you don't, and again, he gets a pass. No one really pulled him up on that. But, Two years ago you said um, it's really effective and now they're failing. So, I mean, evidence that Hawking is just not good at thinking uh, about that particular topic. Um, the unchecked contradiction there, I think, exemplifies Hawking's widely celebrated ethos, like his authority. 
and also, and this is something you see uh, in particular with high profile scientists, to speak uh, to areas well outside their field of expertise. Okay, so these statements, these claims about um, what the government's doing or how well it would be likely to achieve certain things are not really the domain of um, physicists. That's the domain of people called political scientists, or people who study government. So you wouldn't really consult a political scientist for insight into uh, space physics. So why does it, why is it okay to go the other way around? Why should we listen to Hawking when he starts um, making claims about what governments would or wouldn't do? Okay, I've had arguments with people on the internet about this, and it's su yeah. surprising how how quick people are to jump to the defence of Hawking. Usually making claims like, oh, I'm pretty sure he's smarter than you and smarter than everyone else, so maybe you should just get back in your corner. I'm like, oh, okay, he's just in the realm of like smart scientists, so he can just say whatever he wants. So it doesn't work like that. He's got very, very accomplished knowledge and skills in quite a specific field that doesn't give you a license just because you're a physicist to start opening up your scope with authority, with equal authority to things that are well outside your um, field of expertise. Um, this is just a, a quote, not from the TED talk, but again from that documentary. He says, in my opinion, if aliens are here, uh, I suspect the newspapers will be full of the story. This is something I found interesting because this kind of is in my wheelhouse, right? Media studies uh, and media industries. And I thought, really? Would they? Um, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, uh, an American sociologist called Ron Westrom wrote a few really good papers, scholarly papers about UFOs in the 70s. And Westrom was interested in um, what he called social intelligence about anomalies. So how does information about anomalous events move through society? Um, one of his claims was, well, when you look at how particular forms of information move through societies, you start to see something quite interesting. Certain types of information flow very freely through society, unhindered, like um, images of Kim Kardashian, let's say. Other types of information um, encounter barriers. They're restricted. They're prone to secrecy. They're difficult to talk about. They disrupt people. They threaten power structures in society. So it's very naive, I think, um, of Hawking here to assume that information about alien visitation would just move unhindered through society and that newspapers would pick up the story. It doesn't pay any attention to the intellectual taboo around the topic and the way in which the topic is seen to threaten the credibility of individuals and institutions. Remember, newspapers, even the tabloid ones, still need to present themselves as kind of authoritative uh, sources of accurate information about the world. I'm not including the um, weekly world news, but newspapers in general, that's their business model. Yeah, so I mean, my take on it is partly it's a way for them to reassert themselves by, I mean, propping yourself up by putting something down, but also as representatives of science that what they're trying to do is educate the public about what they should and shouldn't be interested in. Mm. Maybe there's more going on to it than that. Maybe they are hired mm. guns, I'm not yeah. sure. It gets yeah. a bit murky. Yeah. Um, but sociologically, I think we can say mm. that's what's going on. Mm. So Westrom's idea was what he called the fallacy of centrality, the false belief that you're at the, the middle of an um, efficient network of information. So, and we see this not just in scientists, but I think in everyday, um, everyday people are kind of prone to this as well. If such and such was going on, I would know about it. I wouldn't need to sort of pursue that information, it would just find its way to me because I'm at the centre of a very efficient network of information exchange. That's a very dangerous logical fallacy. Not to get too dark, but think about how that played out in the case of institutionalised sexual abuse of children. Okay? Um, the fallacy of centrality there made it literally impossible for people to think that something like that was occurring. Why? Because they thought if that was going on, if this was going on in churches and orphanages and schools, all around this country and other countries, of course everyone would know about it. Um, no, people don't know about it because if that um, happens to you, if you experience something as a child that's shocking and it's like, what was that? You might tell one or two people and they might not tell anyone, okay, for all the reasons I suggested before. Well, I think something similar happens with UFO experiences, okay? And Westrom did a very good job of, of mapping this. You just find that um, UFO experiences, like most anomalous experiences, tend to be um, quite closed and the information tends to really be shared with a small social group. 
um, it never really progresses beyond the anecdote to become what scientists call data. Okay, and it sort of it immobilizes the topic in a way. Um, we also have what's called the fallacy of complete reporting. So the assumption that eyewitness reportage of anomalous phenomena is more complete than it actually is. It's based on the false assumption about, uh, as some Western calls a social intelligence system, about the way information circulates through society. So again, if you want to understand how ignorance around this topic is formed, you have to take into account not all information is created equal. Um, people are often more motivated and more comfortable sharing some types of information and less inclined to share, to share others. Um, then he sort of references the SETI project, which he was famously sort of skeptical of. Um, he rejects an argument through ridiculous comparison. Uh, the Greeks called that a diaz um, diazimus. Um, he draws on anthropocentrism and uh, what's called appropriate simplification, our stage of development. Again, what does he mean, mean there, our stage? Is he talking about indigenous Australians? Is he talking about Europeans? Is he talking about the Inuit people? Is he talking about Papua New Guineans? Who? Our stage of development. He plays into this idea of the West is the pinnacle of human civilization. We're kind of the most advanced of the species. Everyone else needs to catch up. When we're talking about our stage of development, that's what he means. He really means white people in heavily te um, technologized um, societies. Um, okay, I promise I'm getting close to the end here. Then again, a, a joke, um, issuing insurance policy against abduction. That seems to be a pretty safe bet. Hawking says, this is an appeal to ridicule. The mockery is a uh, substitute for evidence. X is presented as the subject of ridicule in order to justify Y. Um, UFOs are associated with alien abduction reports. Why does he do that? Why does he make that association? Well, I would, I would claim that allows him to treat both as a singular question and then to dismiss them because he's, he's attached something which his audience probably regards as, as less likely than UFOs. So that conservative definition I provided at the beginning, some UFOs are intelligently controlled objects not made by humans. Hawking and many others do this, bundle those together with all abduction accounts. Why? Because then you can do what's called throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay? That's something that scientists shouldn't do. They should sort the wheat from the chaff and focus on the wheat, not just go, oh, well, there's too much chaff, I'm just going to throw, throw everything out. That's not how you make knowledge. Okay. So just to sum up, um, this is what I'd say. Considerable work goes into ignoring UFOs. It doesn't just happen. So what I'll try to do is draw attention to the work, the actual labor that goes into creating that ignorance and maintaining it. Um, much of the work um, is rhetorical, logically fallacious, um, uh, in ways that build and maintain ignorance, and maybe uh, a little bit of stupidity as well. Um, and examining uh, the ways in which this work manifests in language can improve our ability to talk, think, and learn about those things that we may have tacitly agreed to ignore. So rather than ignoring our own ignorance, maybe we can sort of acknowledge it. Um, and thanks for not ignoring me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your attention. Thank you.